I taught my dog to talk, not with her voice, but with her paws. I own a three-year-old Bichon Frise called Gidget. They are a remarkably intelligent breed despite their yappy image. I taught her from a young age to do tricks and obey commands, and she was a bright and eager student. I always felt she had a lot to say. So, when I saw videos on TikTok and Instagram of dogs who used program buttons to indicate their needs, I thought I might try it with Gidget. I bought a pack, recorded my voice on the buttons. I kept it simple at first. I gave her buttons to make requests and ask for things. Outside, food, water, treat, play. After she had mastered those, I added more. I gave her options about where she wanted to go what things she wanted to eat. She soon learned to pair the buttons up. Outside, park, food, chicken. It was amazing to hear her preferences, to know why she whined or barked. As she grew more confident, I added more buttons. These were more philosophical, and used concepts rather than nouns and verbs. I wasn't sure Gidget would be able to understand them, but she picked them up so quickly, I wished I had introduced them sooner. We discussed the weather, dreams, emotions. She was soon able to tell me if she was happy or sad, tell me she had a bad dream and ask for a particular toy for her playtime. I became obsessed. Her little brain was able to express so much more than I'd ever suspected. I added more buttons. Soon she was able to tell me her mood, ask pertinent questions with the Y button, make decisions based on what I suggested. She also liked to look out the window and tell me what she saw. It was so interesting. Whilst I might look out of the window and see my neighbor carrying groceries from his car, Gidget would watch the same scene and tell me about the bird she had spotted or a stray leaf she had seen caught by the wind. I was able to see the world through her eyes. She'd been using her buttons to talk for over a year before things started to get disturbing. One day, she stopped playing with her favorite toy, looked into a corner, and walked over to her board. Very deliberately, she selected the button for dark. (laughs) I laughed. It was daytime and the sunlight was shining into every corner. No dark, I told her. Light. It's daytime. No dark. I used the buttons to reinforce my message. No. Dark. Light. Day. Gidget listened, but turned her little head back to the corner. After a few minutes, she went back to her board. Dark, she said again. I'm afraid I shrugged, shrugged off her words and the message behind them. I may have even laughed. No dark, I said, light. Gidget humored me. She was a very clever dog. Sometimes while we played, she would stop and examine a random wall, hover by her word board, ready to tell me what she saw. But my previous reaction must have discouraged her. Time and again, she would stamp on the button for dark, and I would look at where she looked and deny it. I added more buttons, and with those buttons came more unease. Dark, stranger, no, cold. I'd stand where she looked to show her it was okay. 
she would whine and cry and hit the stranger button. It upset me a lot. After a while, Gidget stopped using her buttons. She regressed. She stopped asking outside and would whine at the door instead. She stopped asking food and would stand by her bowl and cry. I didn't know where I had gone wrong. I stood in the corner she hated more often, trying to understand why she hated it. It was cold there, colder than anywhere else in our home, but very welcoming. I found it soothing for some reason, but the more I stood there, the more she cried. It started to get annoying. It was just a stupid corner. I'm not sure what to do. Update. Gidget has regressed even more. She has started peeing in the house, which is incredibly frustrating. At first, I brushed it off. Then, I took her to the vets. The vet said there was nothing physically wrong with her and said that she seemed stressed. Uh, she's a dog? What has a dog got to be stressed about? I'm getting sick of cleaning up puddles of pee. I feel like I should punish her. Update 2 Gidget won't come near me now. I hold my hand out to coax her. She turns away. Idiot animal. I remember that I loved her once, but that was before I realized how useless she was. She won't even love me which is the main reason I got a dog in the first place. I spend more time in my corner and watch the little fluffy beast cringe in her bed. The bed I bought her that she doesn't deserve. I'm watching her now. I've been staring at her for hours now and she's done nothing except shake and cry. She used her buttons for the first time in ages earlier. Where? Mum. Mum. Bye. Stupid creature. Can't she see I'm right here? Or is it too dark? Um, my friend isn't in any condition to update her story as far as I can tell. She apparently posted a second update that some of you may have heard, but it was removed shortly after posting. I can only imagine what she said. I don't want to use her name, but you will know her as Gidget's mom, so I'll call her GM. As for myself, I'm a friend who took Gidget away. GM hadn't checked in with our circle of friends for days when I decided to go and see her. We have a group chat that we all access daily, but she'd been absent from it for too long and hadn't responded to a single message aimed at her. I lived the closest, so I volunteered to go and check in on her. When she answered the door, I was horrified at what I saw. GM is normally a very tidy person who takes great care in her appearance, but when I saw her, she looked terrible. There were vast dark circles under her eyes and her clothes were covered in stains. She let me in, and as soon as she turned away from me, I noticed that the hair on the back of her head was matted, as if she hadn't brushed it in weeks. Even though her curtains were still drawn at 3pm, I could still see enough in the dim light to ascertain that her home was as messy as she was. There were dirty plates piled on the floor, stale food congealing on them. And for some reason, she had put a blanket over the mirror above her fireplace. What shocked me more was the state of Gidget, though. It was a running joke in our friend group that GM treated Gidget like her baby. Gidget was completely spoiled and pampered with regular visits to the groomers and an entire wardrobe of little outfits. But the small white scrap I saw cowering in her filthy bed didn't look like the princess I'd come to know and love. Gidget looked like one of those dogs they used in adverts and animal charities. She was trembling when I saw her, but she still managed to wag her tail, giving me a warmer welcome than GM had given, 
and she scuttled out of her bed, coming towards me in an awkward, crouching gait I'd never seen her use before. I didn't know much about dog body language, but it was clear to me that Gidget was badly frightened of something. Or someone. I didn't like to imagine what had been going on, but judging from GM's appearance and the state of her home and beloved pet, it was an understatement to say that something was terribly wrong. I'm afraid I assumed that GM was depressed. It wasn't something she was prone to, to my knowledge, but there was a first time for everything. I tried to be as upbeat as possible. I didn't mention how awful GM looked, but I did instinctively start to tidy up a little. I didn't know what else to do. I bustled around her flat picking things up, recounting such news of our other friend's activities I thought she'd like to hear. GM's silence was unsettling, and being around her made the hairs on my arms prickle. It was ridiculous, but I have to admit that I was scared of her. Something was incredibly off. Not just the mess or the sour smell or GM's withdrawal. Not even Gidget's cowed attitude, which I probably could have explained had I not wanted to consider what GM might have put her through. GM is, always has been, a very sweet person, totally devoted to her dog. I didn't want to think that in her current state, she might have abused her baby, but... I couldn't completely discount it. I felt her behind me as I tidied her kitchen. She stank and reeked like rotten meat, body odor and old piss. I tried to keep up my chatter so she wouldn't know something was wrong, and for some reason it was very important that she didn't know that something was wrong. She was like a dark shadow hanging over me, looming in fact. At one point, I turned and saw a big steak knife lying unattended and put it in the dishwasher just for something to do, so I wouldn't have to make eye contact. Now I was there, I regretted coming. It made me sick to my stomach to be in her presence. The feeling of unease I felt upon entering had only gotten worse. I looked around her flat for an excuse to do something else and saw a little puddle on the hardwood floor. It looked very much like Gidget had peed there. I hoped it had been Gidget and not GM. I made my way to the mop, but GM stopped me. She was very distressed. Her face was right up to mine, and I could smell her breath. It was sweet with rot, thick with something meaty. She told me she didn't want me to do anything else. Not with her voice, but with her eyes and despite the danger I felt coming off her in waves as strong as her body odor, I couldn't just leave. I told her I wanted to help her, or something like that. I was in no fit state to form a coherent argument. You can do something for me, she said, and then I realized it was the first time she had spoken since I entered her flat. Her voice sounded very strange, although... Strange isn't a deep enough word to describe it. It was guttural and thick, as though she were holding Flynn the back of her throat and the words were bubbling through. It's the voice an open grave would have if it could speak. The voice of a basement door covered with cobwebs held ajar with a spike of bone as a doorstep. I asked her what she wanted me to do for her, and her eyes flickered then. Maybe it was just the poor lighting, but for a moment, it looked as though she had a second set of eyelids beneath her usual ones, like a crocodile, almost transparent but with a smoky glaze to them. The corner of her mouth twitched as if she wanted to smile, but then her face became serious again. Her lips moved without sound and now her eyes bulged a little as she huffed rancid breath against my skin. There was a struggle going on inside my friend, and I hoped she was winning. Take Gidget. She said, coughing the words out as if they hurt her. She was holding my arm so tightly it hurt, pinching the nerve by my elbow until I felt my arm go numb to the shoulder. I can't remember what else she said. All I know is that I wanted to leave, and quickly, and I wanted to take Gidget with me. I packed what I could, as quickly as I could. The most important things, like Gidget's bowls and food and bed and the other usual stuff like her toys and leash and harness, along with some of her cute little coats. 
I was ready to go when GM, sitting on her couch and watching me with a blank expression, urged me to take Gidget's talking board too. I hadn't even thought of it, but it made sense. I had always been enthralled by Gidget's board and the way she communicated. It would be fun. I grappled everything into bags, breaking the board down so I could assemble it again at my house and made my exit. Walking out of the front door made me feel as though I'd escaped, though from what I couldn't tell you. It was just such a relief. Gidget stopped to look back before the door swung closed behind us, but I didn't. I was focused on getting out. Every step I took to get away from GM was lighter than the one before. I never thought I would shirk my duties to a friend, that I'd be so eager to leave someone in distress. But I knew GM couldn't be talked down and piled with ice cream and chick flicks to get out of her mood. My shoulder, which felt many tears upon it over the years, did not want to accommodate GM right now. Gidget relaxed somewhat once we got into my car, but she still looked over her shoulder as I drove away. I couldn't understand her urge to look. Personally, I didn't ever want to see that building again. I've read about women who have been kept prisoner in places for years at a time. Colleen Stan, Elizabeth Fritzel, Michelle Knight. It was a fascination of mine. I could only imagine how those women would have felt looking at the houses they'd been kept in after their escape, and I had nothing to compare to their ordeal. But to look back at GM's building was unthinkable. I couldn't do it. Back at my house, I took stock of Gidget's condition properly. She was bedraggled and somehow shrunk into herself, but there was nothing that a bath and a decent meal couldn't sort out. Gidget had been through a tough time, but I couldn't see signs of abuse, only short-term neglect. I bathed her, both of us getting silk amongst the bubbles of her shampoo, and toweled her dry in front of the fireplace. She seemed a lot perkier than she had at her own home and even accepted some of her expensive food, though not as much as I'd hoped. It was probably more for my benefit than hers that I wrapped her in a blanket and cuddled her on my lap, but it did both of us good and after a couple of hours of snuggles, she was confident enough to wriggle from my grasp and approach the bag that held her board. I had dismantled it in a hurry and hadn't reassembled it yet, but she sniffed at the corner of the board sticking out and looked at me expectantly. A very real part of me did not want to put her board together again. I didn't want to know what she wanted to tell me, but the little frill of her tail twitched and her fluffy cheeks puffed out to express a single polite woof. I couldn't deny her. I laid the board out, clicking the panels into place and repositioned any loose buttons before returning to my chair and turning on the TV. Gidget stood by her board for a while, considering her options and I half watched her, hoping she would only ask for a treat. But Gidget had more serious stuff in mind. Mom, gone. She pressed the buttons with her little paw, then gazed at me trying to ascertain whether I'd registered her comment. I smiled a false smile that hurt my face and replied too brightly. Yes, Mom gone. At Uncle Lex's house now. I didn't know it was possible for a dog to look frustrated, but she was patient with me. She examined her board again thinking, then selected some more buttons. Mom. Dark. Stranger. Gone. I felt hot, like Gidget's words had turned the fire up a notch. I pretended I hadn't heard the buttons and concentrated on the voice. The one on TV, not the one asking to get into my head. Stranger. Gidget didn't just press the button, she stamped on it, emitting a little aggravated snort. Dark. Stranger. Bye, Mom. A glance at me, then, Help, Mom. Bye, Stranger. I pretended I didn't know what she meant. I laughed a sound that was jagged and false. Bedtime now, I told her, turning off the TV. Do you want to sleep with Uncle X? Gidget regarded me for a long time, then appeared to give the dog version of a shrug. She sighed and plodded towards my bedroom, not looking at me. I'd let her down, but it appeared Gidget was a lot braver than I am. I didn't sleep well. Gidget's warm little body was a comfort next to me, but my dreams were full of troubling, indistinct images. I tossed and turned all night, waking often, and every time I woke I would stare at the vague rectangle of my bedroom door 
expecting it to be open. I dreamt that someone was leaning over me, someone with negative intent, someone with breath that was scalding hot yet made frost form on my face. More than once, I woke up to find out that I had pulled either the covers or my own pillow over my head as though I was hiding from something. My sleep that night was ragged and sparse, and when the sun finally rose, I was wearier than when I had gone to bed. I didn't want to experience a night like that again. I made coffee in the gray pre-dawn light. I didn't even think about going back to bed. Gidget joined me, looking as tired as I felt. Her perfect little white curls were scruffy and flat, her ears droopy. She didn't look at me for comfort as I looked at her, but went straight to her board and yawned before pressing her buttons. Help. Mom. Bye. Stranger. She flopped down onto the floor by her board, exhausted. I didn't know what to say. I didn't have the energy. I sat down with my coffee and stared at the blank TV. I thought that I should call some of our friends, but it was far too early. Everyone would be asleep. Everyone except whoever it was ringing my doorbell. I thought it might be the postman, though he had never called so early. Barely awake, I put my cup down and heaved myself out of my chair. Gidget was up and alert all of a sudden, staring at the door, her little body rigid with a slight tremor running down her spine. No. She stepped on the button as I walked towards the door. It's okay, Gidget. I told her, still sleepy. Uncle X, get the door. No, 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 no. She pummeled it repeatedly, ears flapping as she bounced. Stranger, no. I looked through the spy hole in my door. It gave me a fisheye lens view of everything outside. Someone was standing slightly to the left of my door, just out of sight. I lifted my hand to release the deadbolt, and again, Gidget stamped on the no button. The imperative behind the robotic voice made me pause. It was a recorded version of GM's voice, made unnatural by the repetition, and the more Gidget stamped on it, the more desperate it sounded. I squinted through the peephole again. I could see a shoulder and most of an arm. Who is it, I asked. Never had I asked for identification before. The figure on my step moved and came into view. It was GM, looking as scruffy as she had before. She was smiling, an expression that looked strange on her crusty face, and one arm was behind her back. The other arm reached up, the attached hand ringing the doorbell again. X, it's me, she said, sounding exactly how she should. Her voice normal now. I'm feeling better. I've come to get Gidget. It should have been a relief. GM sounded fine and I was already exhausted from looking after Gidget. But I did take my hand down from the deadbolt. Gidget was frantic now, pouncing on her buttons just out of my line of vision. GM's metallic voice spoke to me over and over. No. Stranger. No. Mom. Stranger. Dark. No. I sighed, put my head against the cool wood of my front door. I can't let you in, GM, I said. I don't know why, but I can't. Something thumped against the outside of the door right where my head was placed. I moved then, stepped away just a split second before the point of a knife appeared, piercing the wood. I stared at it without comprehension and watched as it disappeared again. Open. The door, X, said the voice from the other side. No. I couldn't tell if it was me or the voice from Gidget's board who spoke, but it didn't matter. The thing on my porch screamed and I heard rapid footsteps. When I looked outside again, GM was gone. Swaying on my feet, I wondered if I locked the back door before going to bed last night. I usually did. I'm hoping I did. But I did hear a weird squeal just now that sounded like the old hinges on my back door opening. It might just be my imagination. But for now, I'm crouched in my bedroom, Gidget close by my knee, and her entire attention is trained on my bedroom door. I feel like I should call the police, but I also feel like writing this down is more important. Strange. I can hear noises in my house. What should I do? I mean... It's only my friend out there, if anything. If you're not caught up, I suggest you go back to the beginning. 
It hurts to say this, not just physically, but that too. I'm covered in bruises and there may be some cuts too, but I'm alive, and so is Gidget. I know most of you are more worried about Gidget. This may take more than one update. I have a lot to process, plus I'm in a hospital so I beg you for your patience. After that last incident, I did the sensible thing and called the police. I sat hunched in my own bedroom with furniture in front of my door and my friend's dog huddled by me while I was on the phone with the police. I stayed where I was, on the phone to the woman in dispatch and listened to the police tear through my house. There were no dramatic gunfights. I live in England after all, but there was some impressive sounding footfalls pounding around. It seemed to take hours before they called all clear, but after looking at my phone I realized it had only been 10 minutes. I came out of hiding then, clutching Gidget to my side. She was very happy to see the police officers and even licked a couple of them. My back door was intact, the lock still in place, and they had gained entry through the front door they told me. That didn't seem right to me, but I was very tired and I thought that maybe I hadn't locked my front door at all, which gives me shivers knowing GM could have burst through at any time she wanted. They took my statement and a description of GM and asked me if I had a friend or family member I could stay with. It was heavily implied that they recommended I don't stay at my home, and I agreed. But although I did have places I could stay, GM knew most of the addresses, maybe all of them. We were a tight-knit group and many of my friends were her friends, so I decided to stay at a motel. I packed the basics for me and again within hours was packing Gidget's stuff. I made sure to pack her board. Gidget knew a lot more than I did. The place I had chosen was comfortable and anonymous. The decor was exactly what I would have expected, neutral and inoffensive, and Gidget had her own bed. She settled down quickly, not even glancing at her board, and fell asleep within minutes of our arrival. I lay awake a lot longer listening to Gidget's high-pitched snores and trying to process everything that had happened. I should have assumed that GM had some kind of breakdown, but my instincts told me otherwise. The sensations surrounding her were far more complex and didn't feel natural at all. GM was my friend, and I felt like I could accept a psychological break far more easily than what I'd felt. I felt evil when all was said and done. A separate entity from my good friend that would only be happy with my death. I tossed and turned but eventually fell asleep to troubled dreams. My dreams did not reflect what I'd gone through, rather they were far more mundane and irritating. I was late for an important meeting and I was wearing inappropriate clothes. My car wouldn't start and I tried to walk to the meeting but I got lost along the way. It was a dream I had many times before, but this time amongst the dullness of it all, little things crept in that I wasn't used to. Whilst I struggled to get my car started, there was a figure, barely registered in the background, hanging from a tree, and whilst I walked along a muddy road in heels in my old PE kit, someone was following me, and always ducking out of sight when I turned around. I didn't sleep well. But when I woke up as the newly gray dawn filtered through the curtains, Gidget was still asleep and I counted that as a positive thing. I let her sleep. I laid her food and water bowls down where she could easily find them and assembled her word board so she feel the need to communicate. So there wasn't much else I could do for a sleeping dog. With nothing else to do myself, I opened my phone and started scrolling. There was a message bubble from Facebook Messenger hovering on my screen. GM's face was in the bubble. I ignored it, although pulling down the notifications at the top of my phone screen told me that she had sent me a disturbingly garbled message I couldn't translate. WhatsApp had new messages for me, but a quick glance told me it was also GM. Again, a first glance showed me only disturbing nonsense. I swiped that notification away too. I was still tired and did not want to be reminded about GM. Another message awaited me on Instagram. I checked all my apps. LinkedIn and TikTok and YouTube also had messages for me. 
My new Reddit account had similar notifications. Even my bank app had a fresh message I didn't want to read. And whilst it was impossible for GM to access my bank app to leave me a message, it was indeed from her. Or whatever was inside her. Everywhere I went, GM was waiting for me. I opened Google. I'm not sure what I was going to search for, but whatever it was left my mind when I saw the Google logo. I know Google changes the logo to a picture for special occasions, but I couldn't imagine what the occasion could be that would require a grainy, partially animated photo of a door. It was in black and white, flickering slightly and looked all too familiar. For a second, I thought it might be the door to the motel room I was staying in, but somehow it was almost worse when I recognized it as the door to my bedroom where I was barricaded last night. The thought that GM had been outside my room whilst I was on the phone with the police and had possibly taken a photo of my door while she was at it, that was disturbing. I closed my Google app without searching for anything. I didn't want to know what might come up in the results. Gidget and I remained in the motel for nearly a week. The police told me they had done a welfare check on GM and hadn't been able to locate her. There was no sign that she had returned to my house either, but I couldn't bring myself to go home. I felt reasonably safe where I was, but I knew I couldn't stay there indefinitely. I was low on funds, and my sick time at work was running out. Besides the more material reasons, being there made me feel like I was on the run paranoid, scared all the time, twitchy and anxious. I couldn't live like that, and the bad dreams had not left me. They were normal dreams I was used to having, dreams I had often in various shapes and forms, ones that were apparently common if online dream dictionaries are to be believed. But there was a darker tinge to each of them that made everything worse. If I dreamed about my teeth falling out, there would be a hand stained red extended ready to receive them. If I dreamed about being back at school, there was always something underneath my desk or in my locker I didn't dare look at. And if I dreamed about falling, there was always something dreadful waiting for me when I reached the end of my fall. And in every dream, a shadowy figure lurked in the background, never acknowledged but always noticed. I'd really done nothing to deal with the situation I was in, just survive. Gidget had tried her best to explain to me what had happened, but her buttons were very limited. All I could ascertain was that something was dark and GM was now a stranger. I ventured into the internet again. Messages still waited for me, but the Google logo had returned to normal, which was a comfort. There were many things I could have looked up, but the one I chose to do was find out where Gidget's buttons had come from and order some more. I'm not sure why I did this but I had a few ideas I wanted to try out. The new buttons arrived quickly, and I agonized over what I would record. How could I ask a dog to express something I didn't understand myself? I allowed myself a little indulgence. I knew what I suspected based on my own feelings around when I'd gone to GM's home, but I didn't know how to translate that into something Gidget could relate to. I started slowly, Recording my voice onto the new buttons. It made me terrified, but I did it anyway. Gidget's name and mom were already there, so I recorded my name on one button. Then I recorded a couple more options. Gidget is such a clever dog. I don't think that we as humans really appreciate the level of intellect a dog can have. GM had told me about Gidget's understanding of dreams but I don't think I really acknowledged that such an abstract thought could be expressed by a little scrap of white fur, and the things I wanted to discuss were such odd concepts. I taught her dog and human. It might seem strange that those were words I chose to record, but bear with me. Gidget. Dog. X. Human. GM. Human. I knew she had some dog friends she associated with, so I used their names to reinforce what I had showed her. Sparky, I said, and hit the dog button. Rebel, I said, and hit the dog button. Once she had gotten the hang of that, I tried the human version. I named all the people she might know and hit the human button after each one. She watched me closely absorbing everything 
and it wasn't long before she could answer questions with her two new buttons. I named everyone she knew, dog or human, and she answered appropriately, working out that dogs and humans were different. I gave her a treat every time she was correct, and it was every single time, except for when I mentioned GM. She didn't press the human button when I said GM's name, or said mom. She had no buttons to press for her. GM was apparently not a human, or dog. I thought again for a long time before I could record another button. I made a button for animal. I wanted to be sure that Gidget understood that whilst we were all animals, not all animals were dog or human. She knew cats of course, having been friends with a local cat, but she also knew cows and horses from her walks. Still, she could tell me that Benjamin, a human, was human, that Misty, a cat, was animal, that General, a horse, was animal. But when I said GM's name, or mom again, she did not respond for a long time until she finally seemed to get frustrated with me and the final time I mentioned GM, get it stamped on her board. Stranger. Dark. Mom. Bye. I knew what she was talking about. That was the worst thing. I knew when I was with GM, she wasn't GM, and it wasn't just a dissociative episode. GM wasn't GM. She was something else. And from what Gidget had told me, it had to do with something dark in their home. Looking back to when I had taken Gidget away, there was a corner of a room in GM's that I hadn't liked. There was no reason for me to dislike it. It looked no different, but there had been a puddle on the floor near that corner I thought might be Gidget's pee. I was going to clean it, but GM had stopped me. She did not want me near that corner, and to be honest, I didn't want to go near that corner either, though I couldn't tell you why. It was a relief when she had stopped me. I think whatever had happened to GM had something to do with that corner, and it was why Gidget didn't think of her as human. So I thought again, wrestled with my thoughts actually. How could I allow Gidget to express herself? I was still pondering over how I could help Gidget help me when Gidget's demeanor changed. She went stiff, digging her little paws into the motel room carpet and cocked her head as if listening to something I couldn't hear. She growled once, a tiny sound almost buried deep in her throat and looked over my shoulder. I felt paralyzed. All the fear I'd been experiencing in the past days suddenly brought to a head. Stiff Gidget did a strutty little walk over to her board and looking over her shoulder the whole time, stamped on her buttons. Stranger. Mom. She hesitated, considered all her buttons. I don't think the word she needed was there, so she tried to adapt. Home, she said. Home? Who's home? Was GM at my house again? Where's mom? I asked, my tongue almost glued to the roof of my mouth. It felt as though all my saliva had evaporated. Gidget looked over my shoulder again and gave a little shudder. Home, she said, pressing the button with a stiff paw. And then I remembered. GM's world had revolved around Gidget and she had a little saying I heard more than once. Home is where Gidget is, GM would say as she snuggled her dog. Gidget was here. So maybe this was home, and maybe GM was here. I have to stop now. I'm sorry to leave you all hanging, but I'll update you as soon as I can. I have statements to give to the police and medical attention to receive, so hang tight. I'll be back to tell you the rest. I'm sorry for the delay. Things have been hectic. So many things have happened and I'm trying to get everything in an order that will make sense. So, buckle up. This is going to be a long one. I didn't know whether to run or hide when Gidget told me by association that GM was nearby. I was absolutely terrified and my main thought was to protect Gidget. My hands were shaking so badly I could barely pack. But luckily I hadn't brought that much with me and hadn't unpacked much when we arrived. I had chosen flight over fight, and whilst running away wouldn't solve things, I didn't know what else to do. 
I packed Gidget's board, including the new buttons, and hefted my bags and Gidget at the same time. She was shaking and evidently terrified, but she was stronger than me. Despite her trembling, she didn't cower into me. She braced her paws against my shoulder where I had slung her and lifted her head, chin high to face whatever might be creeping up on us. Gidget is a ride or die kind of dog. I could feel that GM was close. Whether that was some kind of sixth sense or just my faith in Gidget's senses still isn't clear to me, but I ran, packed up my car and strapped us both in. I felt sick to my stomach. I had an image in my head of GM, filthy and murderous, lurching towards our location, a knife held at her side. She had been searching all week and now she had found us. I drove without any destination in mind and the further we got from the motel, the more Gidget relaxed. She didn't sleep once the danger was over, merely lay down in her seat, eyes open and stared at me, but the tension had gone from her body and that had to mean something. I was still scared though. I felt as though GM was still hunting us, following the trail of our souls like some kind of psychotic bloodhound, and I knew me and Gidget couldn't last on the road. One can't run forever. I found a new motel and checked in. I didn't want to think about it. I was tired of thinking about it, but I knew whatever I had to do had to be resolved quickly. I settled us in, laid out Gidget's board, and returned to Google. I had given up trying to explain everything logically. I'd never considered being in this type of situation and I was running out of sensible options, so I followed my instincts and searched demonic possession. It felt so strange to do so, and I wanted to deny that it could be real, but I did it anyway. My decision was partially influenced by the appearance of a new Google logo that merely consisted of the words, open the door, spelled out in black letters against the foggy background. It was disturbing to see, but at that point I was very nearly done with the whole thing. I was exhausted and hungry and scared, but seeing GM's obvious message just made me roll my eyes. Whatever was in GM was too slow and very repetitive. After an hour or so of reading, I did another quick Google search and found some shops within driving distance that might have some things I needed. I had driven too far for GM to be able to catch up with us so quickly, so I wasn't too concerned about Gidget's safety, but I was concerned about her mental state. I explained to her that I was going out for a while and that I wouldn't be very long. I might have found it strange once upon a time to be conversing so earnestly with a dog, but Gidget had shown me how much she was capable of understanding. She listened carefully to my words yawned, licked my hand, and fell asleep. That was as good an indication as any that she was safe. I trusted her instincts. I bought the crucifixes at the religious supply shop. I had no idea that such stores existed and the fact that one was so close to where I was staying made me decide that it was some kind of omen. I got a big crucifix made of wood with a realistic Jesus carved on it. Someone had put far too much effort into chiseling abs onto him. I also got two silver crucifix necklaces, a larger one for me and a small one I could attach to Gidget's collar. I bought a Bible too, just in case it came in handy. I felt like I was stocking up for a vampire attack. At that point, I wouldn't have been surprised if the shop had also sold pre-sharpened steaks. My next stop was a place that sold herbs. I bought a bunch of white sage that I wasn't sure what I was going to do with, but which had seemed important according to what I'd read online. On the way home, I stopped at a church along the way. I had a large water bottle in the car which was nearly empty, so I drank the contents and went into the church. The front was by the door, so was a priest. I wasn't sure what to say to him, but I held my water bottle and asked if I could fill it. I thought I might have to be sneaky or come up with a valid excuse, but he waved me in without comment or judgment. He watched me as I held the neck of the bottle underwater. House haunted? He asked with a half smile. Friend possessed, I said, and we both laughed. I could have asked him for help, I suppose, but it all seemed so fantastical it didn't occur to me. I should really have asked him for help. Instead, I went back to the motel and Gidget. Gidget was still asleep, and while I don't want to wake her, I did want to make sure she was protected. The first thing I did was slide the smaller crucifix off his chain and clip it to her collar, right next to the tag with her name on it. She wagged her tail at me. I hope it would be enough for now. The second thing I did was use the holy water. I wasn't sure where to use it. 
I had thought about the motel doorways, but I couldn't be certain how many ways in there were, so I settled for pouring a line across the doorway of our room and splashing the door and door handle liberally on both sides. I did glance at the window too, but we were on the third floor, so I didn't think it would be a problem. There was quite a lot of holy water left, so I put it on my bedside cabinet and made a mental note to remind myself not to drink it. After that, there was not much else to do. I fed Gidget and ate something myself, which was difficult with the way my stomach was curdling, and lay down on the bed. Gidget did not have her own bed this time, so she climbed up with me, and it was unspeakably comforting to have her warm, fuzzy body nestled next to me. I decided when it was all over, I would get a dog of my own. I hadn't intended to fall asleep, but the stress must have shut my body down because the next thing I knew it was dark and I wasn't in my bed. Instead, I appeared to be floating high above an unfamiliar road and after the initial panic, I realized I must be dreaming and forced myself to relax. The road was mostly empty, a few cars parked along the curbs and street lights dotted lining it, nothing to catch the attention apart from a lone figure toiling along. Even from a distance, the figure looked familiar, and the recognition seemed to be responsible for me drifting down and drawing closer. It was GM, still dressed in her stained sweats, her hair even more matted than when I seen her before. She was walking with an uneven but somehow inexorable stride, rolling from side to side yet making good speed. One hand was swinging next to her, fingers curled into a loose fist, the other was deep in the pouch of her hoodie. With the curious knowledge of dreams, I felt like I knew what she was clutching in there, and that it was for me. I shouldn't have been able to hear her from that height, but I could. She was panting and muttering in a low voice, and although I could not make out any real words, she sounded angry, and her voice sounded a lot deeper than it had before. I didn't want to go any closer. I felt like if I did, she would sense my presence like Sauron when Frodo put the ring on but my curiosity got the better of me. It was a dream, I reasoned. Scary, yes, but still just a dream. So I went down until I was just ahead of her, seemingly hovering a few feet above the ground. A car drove past without even slowing, which cemented the idea that I couldn't be seen. GM was twitching her head as she walked, abrupt little jerks that made her face blur, and something about the way that happened made me extremely uneasy. I wanted to see her face, I felt like if I could, it would give me more of an idea of her mental state. As she grew closer to where I floated, she faltered, feet stumbling ever so slightly. Did she sense that I was there? I could now see in the false yellow light of the street lamps that her shoes were staying dark and I was horrified when I realized that she had walked so far that her feet were bleeding. GM started forward again with even more urgency than before. Her hand was coming out of her pocket and I saw a dull gleam. She was coming towards me. She could see me. I panicked, willing myself to fly up to where I had been before. But whether my fear was keeping me there, a rabbit in the headlights, or GM was holding me down somehow, I couldn't be sure. I could see her face as the headlights of another passing car illuminated it. The glint of her eyes. They were completely black like I had somehow expected just her normal eyes, but somehow they still managed to convey utter madness. You, she crowed, and whatever was in her hand sliced the fabric of her hoodie as it came free, and it wasn't until she was right on top of me that I managed to break the hold gravity had over me. I shot upwards with sickening speed heading for the stars, but not before one of her hands brushed my foot going straight through it. I woke up in the motel room, my heart hammering away against my ribs, my breath scorching my throat. When I'd fallen asleep, Gidget had been nestled in the crook of my arm, but now I was hugging her close and she was whining, tongue flicking at my face. It had to have been just a dream, I told myself, but even if it had been, it was one I never wanted to have again. It had been creepy enough, but the worst part was when GM had touched my foot at the very end. She hadn't made purchase and... I was just in my dream body, but it was still enough to transfer everything that was happening inside her, and there was a lot going on. I felt her pain first. She had indeed bled through her shoes and was walking on a jellied layer of it, grinding on the small bones that, from the loose way they floated, felt like they could have been broken. 
The tendons and muscles in her legs were surely torn, and it felt like she had a permanent cramp. She was starving too, and thirsty. The thing controlling her hadn't let her eat or drink. It didn't care about her. She was just a vessel, and it would push her for as long and as far as it wanted until she was dead. Maybe then it would vacate the lifeless meat of her body. The second thing I felt was the entity itself. It was angry, but it almost felt like anger and hate were the only things it ever felt. A constant state of being. I saw in whatever passed for its mind what it intended to do to me and Gidget, and there would be no mercy, no hesitation, and we had done nothing to deserve it except escape. I was glad I had only felt it for a split second. Had I felt its emotions for a longer period, I think I would have gone insane. It was a miracle GM had held out for so long, but horrible as the pain and the entity's spite had felt, the third thing I had sensed before quitting the scene was somehow far worse. I had felt GM herself, a scratchy little scream buried deep down inside the whole mess. I don't know if it was her consciousness or if it could truly be her soul, but I could hear her shrieking as if she were at the end of a very long tunnel muffled but not robbed of any of its horror for all that. I didn't know if GM could ever come back from that place, physically or mentally. Even if the entity was driven out, her physical body had sustained so much abuse from the inhumane puppeteer commanding it that I felt sure her internal organs would be shutting down. And her mind? I thought it might be completely broken. I hugged Gidget tight. There would be no more running. It had to end. The showdown came a day later. The entity must have pushed GM's body to unnatural limits in order to get to where we were so soon, but I was glad in a way when it finally arrived. I had been scared for too long, and Gidget had been even more anxious the closer it got. The tension had been unbearable. Gidget alerted me to our visitor around 3 a.m. Neither of us had been able to sleep, and Gidget had been pacing up and down, but she had stopped in her tracks the fuzzy fur on the back of her neck standing up and stalked over her board. Mom, home, she said. I wasn't at all surprised. There was a chair in the room I had wedged against the already locked motel room door, but now I retrieved it and turned it to face the entrance. I sat down, gidget at my feet, the Bible on my lap, the big wooden crucifix clutched in both hands, and waited. It didn't take long for me to pick up on the presence of the thing inside GM. Gidget had felt it sooner because her senses were more attuned, but there was no mistaking the dread rising up in my belly. It tasted like bile, and I felt like I would vomit. There was a smell that might have been real, might have been in my mind, but it was strong and foul. I kept my eyes fixed on the door. Would it open when she, it, knocked? That was the whole point, after all. My phone buzzed on the nightstand, over and over, notification after notification, until the vibrations carried it over the edge into the floor, where it continued to report. I didn't need to read the messages to know what they said. It wanted me to open the door. There was a little time left. Get on the bed, Gidget, I told her. The bed was further away from the door, and I didn't want her to be the first thing GM saw. Gidget whined and remained where she was. I mean it, Gidget. Good girl. Go and get on the bed. I'll deal with mom. She complied with obvious reluctance. She looked so small in that big red bed, I thought, as I looked back over my shoulder at her. Just a tiny little floof, a ball of yarn. I smiled at her. I was still smiling when the shadow appeared in the window by the bed. We were on the third floor. The window shouldn't have been a problem. I had checked, you see. Checked for drain pipes or fire escapes or anything like that and it was just all the way up to our window. But it didn't seem to have stopped GM. She had somehow climbed up there and she hung framed in the window, grinning at us. I saw her very clearly before the light went out and the window broke. She had lost so much weight it didn't even seem possible and her skin hung on her bones. Two of her front teeth were broken, and the jagged edges gnashed at her bottom lip as she smiled. The bloody hand lifted in a wave, so she was hanging into the window still with the other. Her nails were missing, 
No doubt from her impossible climb and the spongy fingertips touched the window, daubing a crooked smiley face on the glass. The light went out then, just as her hand was doubling into a fist and drawing back, and I got out of my chair so quickly it toppled, the Bible falling from my lap. The crash seemed deafening in the small space. I could see very little, the only light coming from a distant street lamp, but it was enough to see the hunched shadow that once been my friend launch itself through the window. The broken glass still in the window frame had formed long spears that didn't deter her, but they did slow her down. She was reaching for Gidget with frantic, grabby hands, but the glass pierced her and held her in place like a beetle on a pen. I didn't have time to process what was happening or to make an informed plan of action, but I did the only thing I could. I hadn't been sure when I bought it what use the huge crucifix would be, but it turned out to be very useful indeed at knocking JM right the fuck out. Gidget hadn't moved. As tiny as she was, she had faced the threat with the spirit of a Caucasian mastiff, and even when GM was still, she didn't let her guard down. GM's hands had just about bridged the gap between the window and the bed, leaving bloody handprints on the covers, but now they dropped onto the floor. She hung over the sill, hair dangling, arms limp, and I didn't know what to do. I'll be honest, I thought about hitting her again, hitting her as many times as it needed to finally set her free, but she had once been my friend, and more practically, my knowledge of the law was sketchy when it came to bludgeoning intruders to death, so I called the police instead and took a look at what I had to hand. I doused her with holy water first. Her body twitched at that and she let out a feeble cry, trying to lift her head. My instinct to help her was strong. She sounded so pathetic, but I wasn't going to get much closer than I already was. I remembered the sage, too, in the long stretching minutes before I could hear the approaching sirens in the distance and thought I might as well use it as it was here. I lit it and it produced a thick plume of smoke that almost immediately set off the smoke alarm but I tried to ignore the piercing beeps and reached out at arm's length to waft the smoke towards GM. It drifted in lazy curls, apparently not aware of the urgency, and I watched it, mesmerized. I wanted it to go straight out the window, so I bent and swished the glowing bundle lower. The smoke swirled and settled around GM's head. She reacted again then, lifting her head and fixing me with a furious gaze. Her eyes were bulging so much I didn't think she could actually close the lids, and there was blood that looked black in the half-light pouring from her mouth. One of her hands snatched up from the floor and managed to snag my ankle, pulling me over. There was broken glass everywhere, and I only dimly felt the shards scraping my back as she started to drag me towards her with strength that was ridiculous considering her condition. I screamed for help, hoping someone was near enough to come to my aid and tried to grab the big crucifix which I had put down to attend to the saging, but it was just out of reach. I kicked at her face, feeling the crunch as a couple more of her teeth shattered, but she spat blood at me and carried on pulling. It was Gidget that managed to stop her. The tiny dog hurled herself from the bed, ears flying, small teeth snapping and clamped her jaw around GM's wrists. GM shouted, not from pain but from rage, and released my ankle to shake Gidget loose. Her fingers were twisting to reach Gidget's collar, but she shrieked again when the little crucifix next to Gidget's name tag touched her skin. She threw her arm back, intending to smash Gidget against the wall, but Gidget let go of her wrist just before impact and rolled away unharmed. I grabbed the crucifix then, scrambling my way through the broken glass until I reached it, and I was just about to smash GM over the head with it again when the police arrived. I'm told that they had to wrestle it from my hands but I don't remember much about that. And now we're pretty much up to date, apart from the aftermath. I'm very tired after writing all this, so I'll give you as brief a summary as I can whilst hopefully covering everything. GM is dead. Not from the blow to the head I gave her with the crucifix, but from the deterioration and damage her body had undergone whilst under the power of the entity, combined with the injuries from the broken glass. They did all they could to save her, but she was far too gone. They said it was astonishing she'd managed to do the things she'd done in her condition. The authorities are staunchly blaming mental health, and I suppose it's a reasonable conclusion under the circumstances, but it's not the truth. I was there, and I saw the entity leave her body once the vessel was no use to it anymore. I remember that part. 
Nobody else saw it. I think that maybe my own mental state had heightened my abilities so much under all the stress that I was momentarily given the power. It was a blurred thing. Dark. Very dark. Some might have mistaken it for a shadow cast by the beam of the police flashlights as they shone them into the small motel room, but it twisted in the opposite direction that a shadow should have, dancing crazily as it detached almost too fast for the human eye to perceive. Something about the movement made me sick to my very stomach and I closed my eyes, but in the last second before I shut it out, it turned and acknowledged me. GM died a couple of days later in a hospital bed, surrounded by friends. She never regained consciousness after the entity left her, and I'm glad of that. The torture she had been through had ended. I remained in the hospital for a couple of days. Most of my injuries were superficial cuts from broken glass, although there was one gash I had needed several stitches, and there was a bruise around my ankle in the perfect shape of a handprint that faded after only a day. Physically, I'm sore, but more or less okay. Mentally, not so much. Gidget's family decided I should adopt her, and that's something I gladly accepted. The little dog and I had become close during a hard time, and I was happy to move all her things into my own home. At some point during all the commotion at the motel, she lost the little crucifix on her collar, so I'm going to get her another one, just to be safe. I know GM is gone now, but I think it's important. Gidget is in much the same condition as myself. Physically okay, mentally not so much. She's been distant and very quiet in the period since we came home. She hasn't had any cuddles and has kept very much to herself. Neither has she used her board, but I have hope she'll settle down soon. I intend to give her all the love GM gave her and more. She'll be safe with me. Update. Gidget used her board today for the first time. She asked for a treat and got her request. I think things are looking up. Update 2. I might need some advice. Does anyone know how these boards work? I've read the instruction booklet over and over, changed the batteries and buttons, etc. But they keep... glitching or something? I know it's probably something in the electronics, but to be honest, it's starting to creep me out. The buttons keep saying stuff that I'm pretty sure GM didn't record, and it doesn't even sound like her voice. Maybe she did it when she was halfway under? Update 3. One of the buttons I recorded myself has started to do the same thing. Same voice. The things they say are reasonably upsetting, and Gidget is using the board very strangely. I can't quite explain how, but she doesn't just hit the buttons. She will stand there, staring at me for a really long time. Then just when I'm getting really freaked, she'll press a button without looking at the board, watching me for my reaction the whole time. I really want to be wrong. Honestly, I do. But the way Gidget keeps looking at me, I keep wondering where that entity went after it left GM. Stupid, I know. But still, I think I might get some more holy water. Just in case. And it might be a coincidence, but Gidget's fur looks darker somehow. Hello. No sad. Dark. Treat. Gidget happy. Human happy. Animal happy. Dark inside. Dark friend. No stranger. No sad. Gidget happy. Goodbye.